Thank you, Jim. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. All right. Well, again, good morning. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to see everybody here. It, um, it just means a lot to, for, for me to have uh, folks come and to see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. And I hope that I know everybody kind of comes with a different agenda. And I really hope that uh, whatever you're looking for, questions, uh, answers to questions, or whatever, that you can get some of that information today. And if, and if you don't, uh, feel free to contact us at any point in time. And, We'll be happy to help you with, with uh, whatever it is you need. Um, as Dr. Whalen said, uh, this is the fourth annual UMass uh, PMP Appendiceal Cancer Symposium, but we actually have a special guest today that some of you may know from the internet. Her name is Dawn Green, and she is, has come all the way from England, and she is the founder of another uh, patient, uh, PMP patient support group called Pseudomyxoma Survivor. And so technically, we are the International UMass PMP <laughs> Appendiceal Cancer Symposium. So welcome, Dawn. And you'll hear from her a little bit later in the program. And it was a great uh, surprise to see her today. So we're so glad she could be here. Um, first, I, I, I don't stand up here alone, so I really need to acknowledge a lot of people. And I just want to really thank the PMP Research Foundation, Jim Carroll and Jerry Lewandowski and Carolyn Lewandowski for all the hard work that you, that you do. We were at dinner last night and I got to hear a little bit about the story behind the story and uh, just how much work. It's, it's a whole another full-time job for them and they are so dedicated to it and that's what makes it work. I need to thank Dora Halleck who helped uh, put this, uh, has helped with every symposium uh, and Pam Devaney for the marketing, and Dr. Whalen, who's our Cancer Center Director, uh, the administrative assistants in our office, who many of you have talked to on the phone, Sheila Burke and Susan Prunier, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, and the person who I definitely wouldn't be standing here without at my right hand is uh, Dr. Mary Sullivan, our nurse practitioner, who many of you know. And I also want to thank the PMP PALS organization. As you probably know, Unfortunately, this year we also lost Gabriella Graham, who was the founder of that organization, but they were kind enough to advertise our symposium on their website so that people could get the information. Um, I want to thank our volunteers who came out this morning to help, uh, Mo Bergstrom, Roberta Braga, Amy Confaloni, who will be here lady, later, uh, Cindy Alcatis, Deb Maddox, Kathy Orowski, and Mary Turvey from the American Cancer Society. All these folks are nurses and other uh, hold other positions within the Cancer Center, so they're very busy uh, people, but um, dedicated to education uh, and helping support uh, uh, patients with cancer and their families in any way they can. So thank you very much for coming this morning. And I just wanted to give you, as, as Dr. Whalen was saying, that it's really a, a, a huge team. When I came here six years ago, uh, I had no idea that this was what was going to develop uh, around me. And I just want to give you a list of the folks that really make up the team of the UMass peritoneal surface malignancy. Some of them you've talked to, some of them you've met, some of them who are behind the scenes. Again, the folks in surgical oncology who already met, uh, our medical oncologists who I work with primarily, Dr. Vina Bethini, uh, who many of you may know, and Dr. Brad Switzer, who's also going to be speaking. I couldn't do what I do without them. Uh, Dr. Otto Walter, who is a pathologist who really has a dedicated interest to this that is invaluable to us making treatment plans. The Appendiceal Cancer Research Group, which Dr. Whalen uh, mentioned, and a whole list of incredible scientists who are brilliant and creative and think of things in ways that I, that I can't even imagine. <laughs> um, but they're the, they're, they're the folks that are really going to get us moving forward with, on the research front. Uh, I, I have to acknowledge the nurses in the operating room and the, and the nurses in the ICU and the nurses on what was 7 East and is now 6 West and 8 West, but <laughs> it's the same nurses and, and they really, they are the face of the program and they make it, they're the success uh, of it. I want to thank our perfusionists and um, uh, Robert is here uh, and he's got the, the chemotherapy perfusion pump, so if you have any interest in those kinds of things, <laughs> uh, feel free to take a look at it. He'll give you a tour. It's actually kind of a fascinating piece of equipment. Um, I also want to thank our staff in the clinic, the surgery residents who many of you have met, and also where would we be without Deb Aronian and the Hope Lodge, right? I mean, <laughs> so many people have stayed there. So thank you all. I, I, I don't stand up here alone, and this is the team that I have behind me, and it's incredible. I have, I've been so blessed in the six years that I've been here uh, to work with such great people. So last year we talked about what was new in 2013, and some of the things we talked about was the incidence of appendiceal cancer, which is much higher than, I, than is reported. 
Uh, we talked about the ongoing controversy and discussion around the pathology of appendiceal cancer and how do we classify it and how do we describe it. And that's actually going to uh, be a topic of our keynote discussion. So Dr. Mastragi, who spoke last year and gave a wonderful lecture on pathology, was in Amsterdam with us where there was an update on this international consensus about how do we talk about appendix cancer. Come on in. <laughs> How do we talk about appendix cancer so that we're all talking the same language so that when I get a pathology report from, you know, uh, Wisconsin, my pathologist can interpret it, I can interpret it, and we're all speaking the same language. Uh, we talked about whether or not people could have um, more than one HIPEC, and the answer is yes, and we'll talk a little bit about that again today. Uh, we talked about what determines the success of HIPEC, how we can optimize the outcomes, and the other big thing that was really coming into the fore in 2013 was the genomics of appendix cancer, and that has actually continued to build in 2014, and Dr. Switzer is going to speak to us more about that and, and give you some of the nuts and bolts of, of how these genes work and, and cause cancers and, and how does that relate to appendix cancer and what do we know about that. And then we talked about some new treatments and clinical trials. So we're going to talk about, update some of these things in 2014. So I wish I could tell you that we've cured it. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to the year when I don't have to have a symposium because we've cured this. Um, but right now, just recently got asked this, is how likely is the, the cancer to recur after somebody's had a HIPEC? And the answer is it, it depends, as many of you know. And, and if you've talked to any surgeon, they'll tell you, they're kind of like, well, you know, they're not going to be concrete and give you an absolute number because it depends on a lot of different variables. But there was a recent uh, publication that came out, actually from the, the uh, Peritoneal Surface Malignancy Program in Basingstoke um, by Dr. Moran. And these, this is, uh, this is um, data that was collected actually over a 20-year period. So this is a really broad long experience that uh, incorporates when they started their program, so it includes their learning curve, which is another huge aspect of, of this treatment, um, and, and includes patients that they, that they treated since they've become really expert at doing this. And what they showed was that they looked at um, 752 patients who over that 20-year period underwent surgery and the heated chemotherapy. And they were able to get what we call a complete tumor removal in 512. And if any of you have had this discussion with a surgeon, you know that getting a complete tumor removal is really important to determining the outcome after, after the HIPEC. And what they found was they, they um, found that they had a, if they could get a complete tumor removal, 74% of patients had no recurrence. And so this is actually one of the, one of the best reports in the literature of of this. And, but what I think is important about this is, again, what I mentioned, is that this includes their early experience where they were kind of learning, as well as their later experience when they're, when they're much more facile at the surgery. And with that, 74% had no recurrence. And of the 26% who did have uh, recurrence of their disease, a quarter of them were able to go on and have another surgery and the heated chemotherapy. And they reported the five-year survival rates for the patients that had no recurrence was 91%. So that is, that's really, uh, really good. And the patient, even the patients who had a recurrence who could undergo surgery and the heated, uh, heated chemotherapy again, an 80% five-year survival rate. So um, it, I, I will say again, it, this isn't um, the, the absolute final answer to this question. Um, but what I think you can see here is that the more experience that we're getting over time and the more advanced, the more um, uh, expert centers of expert, uh, excellence that we have, that these rates are going to improve, that um, the, the risk of recurrence is going to go down. And that, in part, has to do with, um, it, it does have to do with patient selection as well as surgeons getting more experience and the teams getting more experience. So the question that surgeons are always asking each other is, how can we make HIPEC better? So one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to do a HIPEC on a patient who, on a person who doesn't need it. It's a big operation. There's a lot of risk of complications, and it really does take an impact on people. And for those of you in the audience who may not know what HIPEC is, that's the heated intraperitoneal or, or uh, intra-abdominal chemotherapy that we do after we do the tumor removal surgery. 
So the other thing is we don't want to do high pec on people for whom it's not going to help. So there's a couple things we can do. We can actually, to make high pec better, we can actually try to improve the technique of it, which is one thing that we looked at here at UMass. This was a publication that came out earlier this year um, by one of the residents uh, that worked with me in the lab. And what we looked at was, there's, uh, as you can imagine, with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, there's a lot of different moving parts and variables that can be changed. And one thing that we thought was, well, what about the rate of flow of the chemotherapy through the belly cavity? Can that have an impact on how well the HIPEC works? And the answer is, is yes, or probably. <laughs> so what we were able to see was that if you flowed if, the, if the, the heated chemotherapy flowed more quickly, up to four liters per minute, and that's something that Robert can explain to you if you look at the, at the, at the pump, then the time to reach 43 degrees, which was our goal temperature in the belly cavity, was much lower, 40 minutes, than if you flowed at a slower rate of two liters per minute. And if you flowed at a really slow rate of one liter per minute, you couldn't even reach the goal temperature. So this was the first paper to show that actually the rate of flow of the heated chemotherapy has an impact on how well we heat the abdominal cavity and heat the cancer cells and treat them. We don't know that, we haven't been able to look yet at the outcomes in terms of how people do with that based on the rate of flow, but it certainly is something to consider when we're doing the heated chemotherapy. And then the other thing to think about is selecting people who are going to benefit the most from the heated chemotherapy. So this is, um, many of you may be familiar with Dr. Jesus Esquivel, who um, has certainly um, done a lot for advancing the role of cytoreductive surgery and heated chemotherapy for patients with appendiceal cancer and, and other types of cancers. And he has, come, he has put together a classification system called the Peritoneal Surface Disease Severity Score. And what he's trying to do is look at uh, different variables and see if we can select people better who will most likely benefit from the heated chemotherapy. And what they've looked at is, uh, they've get, so there are uh, three different um, parts of the staging system. The first is called the group, or G. And this is based on features of the actual primary tumor, the tumor that's located in the appendix. There's the P, which is looking at characteristics of the implants within the belly cavity. And E, the extent of tumor, which is actually determined by looking at a person's CT scan and giving them an objective measure as best you can from a CAT scan or an MRI. And then each person is given a score based on these different features and then put into a stage, zero, meaning there's no dissemination outside of the appendix, to a stage four, which implies a higher... Um, a more aggressive type of tumor or a more extensive amount of tumor um, either in the primary or uh, at the primary site or in the peritoneal cavity. So I don't want anybody to be confused and think that this refers to the stage of a cancer. This is a different type of staging system altogether. This is a, a stage of advancedness of a person's cancer solely for determining whether a person would be appropriate for a heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And what they found was that um, it was, it's, it's very interesting findings. Now, these are, these are findings that need to be validated. Um, but what they found was that people who did have the heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, of all the patients that they looked at, uh, didn't matter what stage, uh, they, people who had a heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy had a median survival of 80 months. Um, and those who weren't able to have a high pec for whatever reason had a median survival of about 26 months. And most of those patients that were in that group were in the stage four group. There were 18 of them. And these were people who had, you know, signet ring cell, very advanced cancers, a high volume of tumor. And so, um, but what he, they found was that people who have a stage one, the people who did not have a high pec, there were only 12 of them, but in either whether they had a high pec or they didn't have a high pec, their, um, their, median survival or the average length of survival wasn't reached at the time of the study was done. So it seems that there is a group that we could, this is a staging system for which we could really try to determine people who don't need a high pec or people who won't likely benefit from a high pec if their t tumor is, is too advanced um, and identify this middle group who's most likely to benefit from, from a high pec. 
And then the other thing that um, uh, came out this year, again from the group in Basingstoke, uh, was looking at uh, the tumor markers. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with having tumor markers measured. We typically measure three of them for appendix cancer, a CEA, a CA-199, and a CA-125. And other studies have showed that the tumor markers can predict, help be predictive of overall outcomes. And what the group in um, Basingstoke showed was that if people had all three of the tumor markers elevated, that people were less likely to get a complete cytoreduction. Um, it, it probably, I mean, it obviously reflects the tumor biology. And what they showed also was that um, people's survival, if they had three of those tumor markers elevated, was less. Now, this doesn't mean that somebody shouldn't have a HIPEC. Um, it just is information to help the surgeon talk to the person because you know, everybody wants to know sort of, you know, how, how how's my situation? And these this can help us talk to people uh, better about what the likelihood of success of a HIPEC is and what, and may help decide whether or not to proceed with a HIPEC. And I get asked this very frequently when I see people, especially if I'm seeing people at six months or yearly intervals, do you have any new insight into what's causing appendiceal cancer? And like I, as I mentioned earlier, the genomic profiling of every cancer is just the hottest thing right now. But even with appendix cancer, finally people are starting to, to look at it. This is a study that came out this year from Dartmouth, and a number of you actually sent the link to me, and I really appreciated that. Um, and they looked at molecular profiling of appendiceal tumors using massively parallel sequencing to identify somatic mutations. I'm not going to get into all that stuff because I don't really understand all of it. But what the bottom line was, and Dr. Switzer is actually going to go into this in a little more detail, so I'm just going to kind of hit the high points, is that they looked at some appendixes that were abnormal but didn't have a tumor. And you can see here, there's really not a whole lot going on with the genes. They're pretty normal looking. If you had a tumor that wasn't technically a cancer, one of those neoplasms that really isn't a cancer, you start to see a number of mutations, but the ones that you see predominantly are something called KRAS and GNAS. And I know a number of people have had their, their tumor tested, and this GNAS mutation just keeps coming up over and over again, not only for this group, but also in our research and other groups as well. And then if you have, somebody has like sort of the next step up, a low-grade cancer, you can see that the incidence of the KRAS increases a little bit, the GNAS stays about the same, but when you, if somebody has a high-grade cancer, if it's a really high-grade cancer, the GNAS drops out, the KRAS drops down to about 4%, and one tumor, uh, one uh, gene that's come up over and over again in other studies is this, this gene called SMAD4. And the way people are starting to think about this is uh, a lot of tumor, a lot of types of cancers we're taught and, and we know uh, progress from a low-grade tumor to a high-grade tumor, and almost like a linear progression, if you will. It really looks like appendix cancer does not do that. It looks like low-grade tumors and high-grade tumors are very separate. They have very distinct uh, gene patterns. And so that, while we may not actually be able to do much with that right now, it's important information, and it's going to be important in the future when we, when we treat this. So this is another study that came out of uh, Pittsburgh group where they looked, they found that that GNAS uh, gene is mutated in both high, low, and high grade uh, tumors. The other group only saw it in the low grade, not in the high grade. But they also took it one step further and said, well, is this affecting survival at all? And what you can see is it doesn't really look like. The GNAS, whether it's mutated or what we call normal or wild type, doesn't seem to affect survival. Now they said that they, they interpreted their data as showing it being frequently mutated in high grade, but really it was only about 12%. So G3 is a high grade tumor, and they only found two tumors that actually had GNAS, so 12% compared to 47 and 41%. But the fact that it didn't be, wasn't statistically significantly different, here's the p-value here, they were able to, they felt they could lump them together. I think the product, uh, preponderance of the data is showing that the GNAS is frequently mutated in the low grade, but not in the high grade. And I, you know, as I said, we're not really sure how to use that information yet, but it's, it's important and it's, it's going to play out in the future. So here's another study that looked at whole exomes. This is the whole genes of uh, 10 appendiceal uh, tumors, and they were looking for those somatic mutations as well. And then they validated their findings against 19 additional cases. And what they found was that 
uh, very frequently the KRAS and the GNAS were um, mutated together. The high-grade tumors were GNAS wild type, again, normal. So these folks also found that GNAS was not mutated in the high-grade tumors. And they suggest, so they also came to that conclusion that these high-grade tumors are separate lineage from the low-grade tumors. And, uh, and they also went one step further to say, it looks like the appendiceal, on a molecular level, appendiceal tumors are not, as relate, not that related to colon cancers. They really are separate. We're lucky, we're very lucky that appendix cancers respond to the same chemotherapy that we have for colon cancer. But ultimately, when we really can do personalized treatment for people, it's going to be different for appendiceal cancer versus colon cancer. And I just want to point out that this study was actually uh, funded in part by one of the PMP Research uh, Foundation grants. So are there any new treatments? Well, Dr. Bistragi, who's going to be coming to speak today, um, actually put out a, a really neat uh, paper looking at the significance of the proximal margin involvement in low-grade appendiceal neoplasms. Now, it, I have always been taught in practice that if there's a positive margin, somebody has uh, their appendix taken out, they find out there's a tumor there, and there was some tumor left at the margin, that we should go back surgically and remove that margin. And even for the low-grade tumors, well, they were able to find 16 patients who had that scenario. They had their appendix taken out, there was some tumor left, and some of the patients had surgery to clear that margin and some didn't. And what they found was that in the six patients who had the additional surgery, there was no tumor left behind. And of all the patients, all 16 of them, none of them had a recurrence. So food for thought. So they, you know, if we can avoid a surgery in a person, then we should avoid a surgery in a person. And I'm a surgeon. I like to operate. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Whalen didn't hear that. But <laughs> so um, here's a, another interesting study that came out of the group in Toronto who has only recently started doing HIPEC. So it's taken Canada a little while to get going with the HIPEC, but they, they really are getting into it now. And Toronto is one of the big groups up there. And they, so they had a, a unique opportunity to look back, do a retrospective review, and look at people who had um, surgery alone and people who they just watched for a while. And it's not something that we necessarily have um, those patients uh, to do that here because we, we are able to do things right away. And so what they found was that for patients who went, underwent what they called expectant observation, um, they, they did notice that the, the so they, they looked at the two groups, the group they called expectant observation, the people they watched, and the people that they operated on. And they were, they were different based on the amount of tumor that they had. So people who had a lot of tumor, they said, no, no, we got to operate. But somebody who had a little bit of tumor, let's, let's kind of keep an eye on it for now and see how you do. And what they found was that carefully selected patients with low volumes of tumor actually do reasonably well with this expectant observation. What happens is they followed people closely over time. If their tumor grew, then at some point they would consider doing the surgery and the heated chemotherapy. And I, and I share the study with you only because that is actually a lot of how I practice. And so I have a number of people that I am following who have a very low volume of tumor. And I, it, it, this is, I've, I've always reassured them that it's OK and safe to do that. You're not going to miss an opportunity to get a full cytoreduction reduction and potentially cured or get the best treatment that you can. And I think, this, I think this is lovely that they were able to show this in data, that they actually had the data to support this practice that not only myself but other people follow as well. And then this is a, a very interesting approach. This is something that, that I, when I was in the lab, that I uh, dabbled with and thought this would be great. C can we come up with a way to just um, dissolve the mucin that is made with pseudomyxoma. And so I know some people have asked me questions about, you know, what does it look like? This is what it looks like. It, the, this is, the red is a little bit of blood, but it's kind of this gooey yellow stuff. And what the, this group from uh, down in uh, New Zealand did was they tried all different compounds to see if they could dissolve the mucin. And they came up with a uh, concoction of 300 micrograms per ml of bromelain and 4% uh, N-acyl cysteine for three hours at 37 degrees centigrade. And this is what happens to the mucin. It becomes a clear, thin fluid. And they have used this in an animal model, and it seems to be safe. And I'm expecting at some point that they will, they will probably do a clinical trial with this. And so this, you know, because if you could dissolve this stuff and then remove the ascites, that could be very helpful in a number of ways. I mean, it, uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of that. 
And then finally, um, uh, Dr. Logie out in Nebraska has really been focused on the inflammatory response uh, and what role does that play in pseudomyxoma and the ascites that develops. And what they looked at was something called cytokines. So cytokines are these little proteins that are released when there's infection or inflammation. It's part of our immune system. And they, he wanted to see, is there a specific pattern of these cytokines when somebody has pseudomyxoma? And what they found was that, yes, there is, that the cytokine pattern in PMP is distinct from infection or injury associated inflammation. And one in particular that they looked at was this thing called IL-6, where they could see it. It's the, it's the dark brown stuff. This is in um, actually not the cancer cells themselves, but the, 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 the tissue on which the cancer cells is embedded. That's called the stroma uh, of the site, but also in the tumor cells as well. So it, it, they felt that based on that finding and some other findings that IL-6 appears to be playing a central role in the PMP biology. They put together this ridiculously complicated <laughs> diagram um, that shows a very complex relationship between the PMP cytokines and something called C-reactive protein, which many people have probably had measured. And what's interesting is that the C-reactive protein is elevated both in the PMP and in the blood. And it really seems to be uh, linked to a number of those cytokines that they found. They also found that IL-8 and something called MIP-1B are, can be measured in the blood of, of people with PMP and that these may be potential targets for therapy. So another exciting front uh, of where things are going in 2014. Are there any new clinical trials? Well, there's one new clinical trial, uh, and it is for people who have unresectable, well-differentiated appendix cancer. And it is for a role, is there a role for intravenous chemotherapy in those tumors, which, as many of you know, tend to be slower growing, and we uh, don't expect them to be as responsive to intravenous chemotherapy only because of how chemotherapies in general work. And it's called a crossover trial where people are randomized either to wait six months and then start chemotherapy or start chemotherapy and then be followed for a period of time. Um, the other trials are, are, have been ongoing for a while. The Icarus trial is a randomized trial of HIPEC versus early postoperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy where a catheter is left in the belly cavity and people get the chemotherapy after the surgery. That's at the Memorial Sloan Kettering. There's another multi-center trial that's being led by the group at Wake Forest where they're comparing oxaliplatin versus mitomycin as the chemotherapy for the heated chemotherapy in appendiceal cancer. This is actually an important question because it's going to give us some insight into the actual role of the heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And then there's another, uh, the group down at WashU in St. Louis is looking at the role of the intraperitoneal chemotherapy that's given as an outpatient. Uh, any of you who are familiar with how ovarian cancers are treated, um, advanced ovarian cancers are treated with in, uh, chemotherapy that's given in the belly cavity as an outpatient. And these folks are applying that same concept to appendix cancer, which I think makes perfect sense, actually. And this, all this information is available on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, these are just specific to appendiceal cancer. There are other trials if you were to look at carcinomatosis would give you more trial options, not specific to appendix cancer, but that could be related. So. So and I, unfortunately, in 2014, we still have a, a ways to go, and we have a lot of heavy lifting to do. But I think if we, if we go there together, we'll get there. And so I just want to thank you again for coming today. I hope you enjoy the symposium. I, I hope um, you enjoy the, the company, and, um, and thank you.